wonderful intro. Um, yeah, I'm going to quickly share my screen as well. And um, yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. So it's always fun to talk about Deneb. I could do it for a long time. Nice, yeah. um, hopefully we're going to learn some cool stuff together. I am very enthusiastic about um, Deneb because it's, well, we'll get to the why soon. Um, but yeah, thanks for posting the links. Like I say, on my YouTube channel has kind of accidentally turned into a primarily Deneb channel, to be honest, just because I enjoyed so much with the odd live stream as well. But uh, click on it and learn some stuff. And hopefully this will be like the first steps to kind of inspire you to get into the world of Deneb. So I haven't got many slides. So don't worry. It's going to be mostly like actually looking at the tool. You're not here to see me talk about PowerPoint and stuff. So let's go. So Deneb, the star of custom visuals, it's a bit of a bad pun because Deneb is like a star system or something. But Deneb is a very, very powerful custom visualization, which basically allows you to build really bespoke custom visuals. Yeah, these are my links. We've spoke about those already, but go and find them if you want to. Uh, why custom visuals though? Well, I think anyone who's been in a situation when they're using Power BI or any, you take a specification and you can't build the thing that you want to build or you run into some kind of situation where you have to do like a visual hack. And um, this is getting better in Power BI, I'll be honest. They're doing great projects to improve the visualization process. However, they would have to put in a, a gargantuan effort to actually allow you to do in a standard visual what you can do using Deneb. Um, any, I mean, anything that you don't get from by standard in the Win Power BI is a custom visual, such so like a chiclet slicer. But Deneb is very different because, as I say, you're building these bespoke visualizations. Yeah. Um, of course, there is a bit of a learning curve, but that is the learning curve is kind of what we're kind of here today to kind of get over and to show you that though it can be complex or can certainly look intimidating at first, it really isn't. I mean, there's, it's been fantastic to see in the Power BI community over the past few months um, longer that Deneb has kind of slowly become a lot more used by people who use Power BI because there's lots of learning resources out there, all of which I'll, I'll also link um, towards the end of this presentation. So the next slide is basically just a person's name. The reason for that is because I have done a fair few presentations on Deneb and I in many of them I've also forgotten to mention Daniel Marsh Patrick, which is pretty shocking of me because he created Deneb. Okay, so Daniel Marsh Patrick is a person who created and uh, Deneb. It's not his um it's not his job. It's like a, a side hobby, if you will. He puts in a lot of time, a lot of effort. So Massive respect to him and thank you so much. And um, it's it's amazing what he's created. So that slide is there just for me, essentially. And to say thank you, Daniel. Anyway, talking, talking, talking. Custom visuals, visuals, let's look at them. It's the best way to look at a visual is to look at them, right? So I'm going to share a different screen or move to a different screen. I hope you can all still see my screen. Um, it should be fine. Um, if not, just be loud, let me know. So this is a report that I've published, and this is you can find this on my website. Um, and it's just what I wanted to do was give some examples of what you can do with Deneb, because like I say, the best way to understand the benefit of it is to actually look at what you can create. Uh, I won't get into, into the, the detail of every single one of how you do it. But what important is that you can do it. Yeah. So this is basically um, using fantasy football data. And what I wanted to do, I actually got the um, idea for this from this the big book of visualizations. I forget the book exactly now, um, but I wanted to give like some dynamic, large dynamic text, which is a lot harder. To, you can do more now with data labels in Power BI since they've released custom data labels and what have you. Um, but this was for me a nice example of creating something that's a little bit different, a little bit out of the ordinary, and is also quite dynamic. And you know the the text labels changes based on the team that you click on. And it's nice to have these large kind of like indicators to bring the point across quickly and what you're actually trying to, a message that you're trying to give whoever is using your report. Other than that, it's quite a standard area chart, to be honest. So the visualization itself has got some gradient, okay, no big deal. But these large texts, I thought was something that was quite nice and, and helpful to look at. The next one is somewhat different um, and these are just, Bear in mind just examples of what you can do 
with denim. Never do I say that what I have done or what I've created is any sort of visualization best practice. I would never claim that. This is mostly me just playing to see what I can do, if it can be done and if I can do it well, okay? Um, so the point of here was tracking targets, right? So in this one, I use a slicer, but of course, in reality, if you were connected to like a data that changes, like you're tracking, you know, whatever, sales against planned sales, this would move up on its own as the sales increase. So here, if I have the slicer, you can see that the, the target's moving up. Um, it gets to a certain point, it gets to orange, it gets higher, it gets to you know green, and then goes even further, it comes at the top, and you have this little, like emoji coming out, which I know is a little bit over the top, but again, an example of what you can do. And um, there is potentially scope to use that in some reports, whatever you're you're looking at, but again, it's the concept of what is possible. Similar thing here, just did a bit more in a standard way, perhaps move the slicer along. And this time when you get to the top, you get this text that appears that we have surpassed our target. Just an example. And here, just tracking percentages of, of a category breakdown. The numbers that I've used, unfortunately, aren't great. They're all kind of, they're all kind of the same. Um, but you take my point, this is tracking, um, you know, a breakdown of percentage within certain categories. Yeah. Next one's a little bit silly, SVG points. The point part here is that you can use SVG paths when you're using Deneb. Wonderful thing about that is that means you can use pretty much any shape that you want. If you have an SVG path, you can use anything. I mean, you can draw your own shape and then use that within your report. And here, for example, this is very silly, I understand, but I have a legend that is hippos because I had the SVG path of a hippo. So I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this because I understand the silliness of it. However, the concept is SVG paths, you can use them and they're very helpful. This one, I'm calming down a little bit here. This is a much more standard situation. So what I really like about this one is that you know, we've all been in the situation where we have a matrix and you really difficult to get the precise um, column width of your matrix. It's really difficult to kind of put that into place and specify what you want it to be. You kind of have to hack that. You use Deneb, you can just build it and so you get this really nicely structured matrix. Um, also, this offset bar, you know, you have your actual, you have your plan and you're able to kind of push them to one side so the values kind of stick out more. Something that's pretty easy to achieve, to be honest, using Deneb and um, bigger light in Deneb and a little bit harder if you have a standard um, Power BI visualization. Also, what I want to show here is that you can use expressions. So for example, here it's a very gray looking report. However, if I click on something, it changes the color because you can specify what happens when you click on stuff, right? So I've specified that all the others kind of become more opaque. No, more transparent. I always got that wrong. My God. Um, and the color changes the ones that I click on. Similarly here, if I click on the total, this entire row goes purple and you can see. So, you know, you don't lose any interactivity. I mean, that's that's a great start. You're not losing any interactivity between the different visualizations, but you are gaining a lot more with what you can do, how they look when they do interact. Um, so this is a quite nice example. And this is quite a, I think, helpful example for standard reporting, to be honest. Bar charts and matrices are pretty standard, which is good because the next one is not standard at all. It's actually quite ridiculous. So I apologize. Um, I was just playing with gradient. This is ridiculous. Um, but you can use, what I was looking at is this, you can use gradient on anything. So you can use gradient on the bars, you can use gradient on text. So that's a helpful thing if you want to use gradient, but we can move on from here because it's a little bit, whatever. Pattern fill, um, so a nice way to display data. This actually pattern fill is one of the reasons I linked the Deneb documentation in the Teams chat because the pattern fill isn't standard Vega, Vega Lite. It's actually a Deneb functionality. So there is documentation that you can look at actually within the Deneb page, which is actually right here. So I can use that. So you have all this Deneb documentation and pattern fill is actually one of them. And all the documentation for that is there. Um, let's legends. Just me playing around with legends. You can the, the point that I'm trying to get across with a lot of this is like you can change some stuff that usually you wouldn't change. So specifying the shape of the of the of the um I can't think of the, the legend, the location, the background, these these little bits and pieces of stuff. That's what I'm trying to get across on this page. Nothing huge, but the functionality is there, so I want to show it. The next one 
is actually the newest page and I worked on this last night and it was really good fun. So um, I wanted to try to do these warming stripes because there's a guy who actually, I think I've linked him on the next um, page. He, he created this using Vega. Now I use Vega Lite, he uses Vega. Vega, I find more complex. Um, I'm not very good at it, to be honest. I'll stick with Vega Lite. Um, but to that, I have really never met any limitations from what I need using Vega Lite. I'll show you what later what he creates using Vega, and it's pretty special, to be honest. But this is cool because, you know, it's, I think it looks quite nice. What I've also included is this functionality where you can kind of like click something and then drag it along. So you can actually specify a certain range within your data and look at that. It's not perfect because I did notice that for some reason I have this here. So I haven't perfected it yet, but the functionality is very, very good. Well, it looks quite nice. No, I like it anyway. And this is basically a concatenation. And one of the basically, I've got two visuals within one. And it's the same thing here. This is two visualizations within one. You concatenate them, you kind of group them together. One of the reasons I want to mention that is because the question comes quite often, um, you know, what's it like for performance issues? Like, of is, is Deneb slower? than using a standard visualization. Not really. I mean, custom visuals are always a tiny bit slower, but nothing special. Um, but I've never really, I've got reports that are just Deneb and I've never had many, any issues, to be honest. Um, it can be an issue if you have a very, very heavy data set and but any issue that I say you encounter, you're going to encounter with the standard report anyway. You're just going to notice a little bit faster using a custom visual. So that's not a Deneb thing. It's a custom visual thing. However, the point is because you can concatenate your visuals, you can essentially create one page that's just one visual if you chose to do so. So you can have one visual that's six visualizations together concatenated, which is quite cool and pretty helpful. Um, because we still have, if I click here, you still have the function, the interaction between them. Yeah, so you, again, you're not losing any functionality. So it's a really handy thing to have. Um, Sparkline, so these, these are two that I didn't create. I've just um, adapted them slightly, so I've linked them here. Taze creates amazing stuff. Um, actually, I should try and I'll link that later. I apologize for not having done so yet. Um, so Taze has a great GitHub, great reference. And this was like a really nice a nice and clean way, I thought, of just creating some kind of spark lines, you know, looks quite cool. The final one, and this is um, the same person who I kind of inspired me to create this. This by Andres, he created this using Vega. Now, this is so far beyond me, then I just can't even put it into words. I can't. I would never be able to create this. So you create this using Vega. And for me, it's a fantastic example of using Vega to create, um, you know, like an infographic. Um, you would, for me, you don't need Vega if you're doing pretty standard business reporting or beyond standard business reporting. But for this sort of thing, Vega is fantastic. So that's basically what I want to show you just to kind of show you a bit of the functionality. And what I'd also do is say, before we go any further, are there any questions about that? If not, I'll just I'll just keep on um, talking. And I want to show you how to use the, the online editor next. So far, is everyone happy? I'll take quiet. I mean, you're happy. Cool. All right. I just have a question. Yeah, please. Sorry. Uh, hello, uh, hello, Ben. I just have a question about the security. Is it secure to use the uh, DENAP or not in it's terms a, of data? It's a but it's fully safe. It's basically you have there's a very, very strict process you have to go through to get to become a certified visualization. And Deneb has been through all of those. It actually has the same. I'm pretty sure that a custom visualization has the same level of. Um, uh, of security checks to go through as a Microsoft visualization has. So it's it's completely safe. There are two versions. There is a there is a non-certified one as well, which you have to use if you want to use maps. Yeah. Um, but the certified version, which is what I use, um, which is what I'd recommend you use, is completely safe. Completely. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. And thank uh, you for having me. Mm -hmm. Uh yep. So uh, I recall like if you want to you want to use third parties uh, visual, you have to go to a marketplace to install it. 
Correct. So with DNF, you need to install it as well. Yeah, you do. Yeah. I'll I'll get to that okay. when we when we get to the actual the, the the creating side. I promise. Okay. Cool. So the next thing I want to do is to show you about using the online editor. Now the reason for that is because a barrier to actually to get into Vega Lite is sometimes actually just going into Power BI or uh, opening your Power BI desktop and then installing Deneb and then getting data and stuff. So this is the documentation for Vega Lite. And it's very rarely I would actually speak with such enthusiasts about documentation because documentation is usually pretty boring. But this is fantastic. I've already linked this website and I would highly recommend you check it out. So this is a documentation for Vega Lite, Vega and some other stuff, but we're just going to focus on Vega Lite. Um, the beauty of it is that you can click on examples and then straight away there are many examples of what you can create with Vega Lite. Okay, many examples. Um, the documentation is also very solid. Shows you really, you know, each element. But I'm not going to get to that now. Check out the documentation. But the examples for me is a great place to start because if you click on one of the examples, just go for example, like I don't know, a simple bar chart. Pick the first one. You can see the code that's written. Yeah, you can see the the, the bar chart. But if you click here, you also have like interactive documentation. Yeah. So here, for example, you can see that we have a, you know, a bar chart. And you have here, we have our X axis and here we have our Y axis. And because generally speaking, people who, who I'm talking to in these situations know, have some idea, I mean, have a, a at the very least, a basic knowledge data visualization. That means you know what an X and a Y axis is, right? So if you want to experiment here, you can actually just change stuff here and see what happens. Yeah. So for example, if I wanted to say, uh, I don't know, make it a line chart. Well, we know this is a bar chart. And just by reading here, and I know the first time you see it can be a little bit overwhelming, but using the most basic example, I can see the word bar written down there. Yeah. So with a little bit of knowledge, knowing that that says bar, if I just typed like the word line, for example, you can then see what happens and then see that it's now a line chart. Yeah. So to have that functionality where you can just basically go to a, a website and just basically type in stuff to see what happens for me was very, very helpful. So go back to bar and then you can just do small things like switching around the X axis and the Y axis. So now we have it that way because I switched the X and Y axis, which is a better way of showing categorical data anyway. Um, so for me, this is a really strong place to get started if you want to learn about Vega Lite um, or, or Vega, because what you do here is essentially exactly what you're going to do within Deneb. Deneb is like a conduit for using these languages yeah so you we're going to do this in a second don't worry i'm going to show you then <laughs> we're going to um you, everything that you see written here you'd write in pretty much yeah i think exactly the same way as, as you do in, in them so you can just copy and paste this so i can do that now so if i go for example to if i just literally copy this i know Hope this works. No, I've never done it before, but I hope it works. So if I go now to my Power BI desktop, so this is Deneb, which, as I mentioned before, I did get into my Power BI desktop by simply going to get more visuals and then searching for Deneb. I won't do it now because sometimes it's a bit slow. You'll see that I have two versions, this Deneb and this Deneb. This is the standalone version. This is non-certified which is what you can look at if you're going to do maps because um, a, a mapping visual can't be certified. Um, so this is the official certified, completely safe one that I use. Um, also free, by the way, I should mention the fact that it's free. Using Deneb is free. Creating visuals is free. There is nothing about Deneb that will cost you anything other than your time regarding learning what you have to do. Yeah, you can share it with as many people as you want. There's no licensing. They can all see the visuals all the time. It's fantastic, truly. So then I click on it. And then quite a standard experience. It has some, you know, getting started stuff. So I can just go on these ellipses 
click on edit and it will open up this kind of like Deneb area. And I think it won't work now because yeah, you do actually need to have a, um, see if I actually don't have any values in my data fields, it won't work. So even if I, I'll just put a value in if you're, I'm not gonna use it. Another great thing, if you want to have a, an example, the examples are there for you, yeah? So if you want to create a simple bar chart, it's there grouped. So you can click on some examples and just use those if you want, perfectly fine. I'm going to start with something empty because I want to see what happens if I just copy and paste it. So if I try and do this and I just hope for the best. Exactly, so as you see, I have exactly here what I have here because I just copied and pasted. So the experience is pretty much identical. Right, so this is why I think that this is a fantastic way of learning how to use Vega Lite because there are so many examples. And as you get, you know, more confident, you can start to try more complex things. There are a few ways of learning. I think this is this, this is a good option. Um, and as I say, the documentation is very very strong. So you know, the tutorials, all this type of stuff. So I would highly recommend it. Cool. So this is what I just created. I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to close this. I just wanted to show you that this is what you can do uh, quite easily when you're using Deneb in Power BI, because like I say, it's just a conduit for writing your Vega Lite, which is what I just did. So I'm just going to delete this. And what I want to do now is show you how to create a visualization using Deneb in a more standard way, not the way I just did. You wouldn't copy and paste something from there. You'd use actual your data that exists in uh, in your report. So this currently is a table, so I can just change it if I want to a Deneb visualization. Do what I did before, go on edit, and it takes me here. This time it works straight away. I don't have to add anything because I, I already have my values here, right? Again, I have my options. So. Before I go any further, I'll say it says Vega Lite, Vega, or import from template. Vega Lite is what we're going to work with. That's all I work with. Um, you have to specify the two because the languages are slightly different. Yeah. So if you're going to work with Vega, click there. If you want to work with Vega Lite, click there. I can't say I would recommend starting with Vega Lite. This is not true. That's just what I did, and I'm perfectly happy with it. If you want to start using Vega, absolutely go for it. Um, import from template, though, is a really important one because it's what is fantastic again is you can create a visualization and you can ex when you've created the code that you're happy with you can export that as a template now one of the barriers of using a visualization like Deneb is the fact that there is that learning curve involved so you can ask yourself you know is that okay to use at a company right if i'm the only one who knows how to use Deneb or if i'm the only one who knows how to write in vega light and I'm sick, or if I leave the company, or, or one of many things, or someone else just takes over a report, um, roles change. Can that person support or develop what I've already done? Which is a fair question. I would say that it's so well documented that that person, anyone could learn. And it's great to have obviously a, a, a wider knowledge base than just one person. So I think if you as a company decide that you want to use this, then of course, like anything, you need to train a few people on how to do so. I would also say that if you look at how a lot of Power BI reports are built, you have situations where someone is, you know, just creating a report full of like bookmarks. And, and that for me is, much harder than taking over something with Vega Lite because it's really hard to document that sort of stuff. But with Vega Lite, it's much easier to document it because the documentation is all there, the code is there. It's, it's something that's written down, you know? So yes, there's a barrier. Yeah, it can be, um, it presents extra challenges, but I think nothing that, can, that can't be overcome. It's just having to add resources to creating certain sorts of visuals. Anyway, I digress. I'm going to click on empty and I'm going to click on create. So what are we looking at here? I can't really zoom in here, by the way. So if you, if it's too small, you'll have to zoom in on teams. Sorry about that. Um, so 
first things first, what we have here is nothing, right? We've got data, which is a data set. So basically it's referencing all the data in our data set. And then we have layer. Now, what is the layer? Best way to show you what a layer is, is to actually just create something. So say for example, um, I want to create any, any mark. So basically a mark is a bar or a right. It's basically the shape that you're using in the visualization, right? So I want to say, I want to create a mark. So I've got to open up a curly bracket. The hardest thing for me about Vega Lite is the typing because I'm terrible at typing. I always have a typo or a missed a bracket or whatever. So I apologize. You're going to see some bad typing. You got to bear with me. So I'm going to type mark. It's a good start. Mark. And then I want to say the type of mark. And I want to create a bar chart. Okay. Close that off. And then hope it works. And to um show the changes you made, you can do one or two things. You can click on here to apply it one step at a time. You can click on here to auto change. I don't like that. It's quite frustrating. Um, I tend to use this one, but just so you know, you won't ever actually see me go up there because I have a shortcut in my mouse. So I'll I'll try my best to go up there, but sometimes I'll forget because I always click the shortcut in my mouse. So I'm gonna click on play and you see something straight away. So it's one big square or rectangle, depending on the shape of the visualization. So just to show you, if I go back to my report now, I'll just do this and it'll just change as I go. So basically you have created something, you've created a mark bar, but you haven't actually given it any context, right? You haven't said, what is it? What should I do with it? It's just a bar. Um, to demonstrate different layer types, different mark types and different layers, what I will also do is then basically create another layer. And what I love doing when I use Vega Lite and something that I try to say quite often is that copying and pasting is your friend, yeah? So I'm just gonna copy it, put a comma so I have another layer, and then I'm gonna go mark type. So obviously I've got bar again, but that makes no sense. So now if I were to say mark type, I don't know, point, for example, I don't know mark type point. I want to hit change. I've applied that change, but again, you see nothing. Why? Because it's the same color. It defaults to um, a color that is within. You can use, you can reference, by the way, the colors in your Power BI color scheme. If you're using your own color scheme, whatever, you can do that. I'm not going to do it in this session, but you can do that, no problem. But the reason you can't see the mark type point is because basically it's the same color. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to specify a color. So my mark type point, and I want to say, let's just say color to make it stand out. I'll say color. I want to make the color red. So I'll type red. Apply that change. And now you see this little red dot in the middle. It's very small. So I can say size. Let's just make it something ridiculously huge so we can see it okay i don't know say so 50,000 is that gonna be too big let's try okay that's fine actually it's 5,000 there 50,000 so now you can see you have this point on top right so if i do this again what i'm going to do now is to click on this by the way repairs and formats the 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 way you write your code so if you click here it'll change it a little bit makes it easier to read if i just get my uh, my color and i copy it and I say here, I actually want to change the color of this. Oops, made a mistake. So I got the comment in there as well. Now it's all red. So now I can say white. There we go. Now we have the Japanese flag. See, we create our first vision. We'll create a Japanese flag. It's fantastic. No? Um, so that's basically what layers are the marks on top of marks so for example if i then copied this yeah the bar and i switched around the order so i'm just going to remove this here and i'm going to put it after this mark put my comma change it now you don't see the point because the white bar at this point it's not a bar but at the white mark is sitting on top of the red point so the order does matter yeah bear that in mind so that's what we're creating this is we're creating different marks laid on top of one another and when you specify you know 
all the things you need to specify, that just builds into your visualization. Yeah, cool. So let's change it a little bit. Let's say, um, let's add some stuff that makes more sense now. So I'm going to get rid of my color white and I'm going to make sure it still works. And I've forgotten to do something. There you go, now it works. So we're back to our original mark type bar. What I want to do now is, of course, specify stuff like an X axis. This is why at this point we just have one big rectangle because we haven't got we haven't specified any axes at all. So I'm going to do that now. So outside my mark, you can do this in different ways. So if the X axis is shared by every single mark, then you can write it actually outside of the mark or you can put it inside. We'll probably get that in a bit later. But what I want to do now is add like encoding, you know, so I want to say that. You know, X axis is this, Y axis is that, all that kind of stuff. So encoding. And then I can say my X axis basically, and then I've got to like, give it meaning. So my X, and I want to say that the field of the X is going to be, let's say we have here year, that makes sense. Oops, excuse me. Hopefully, I haven't made a mistake here. Encoding. Cool. So I say cool, still looks terrible. I totally understand that. But now you can see we have something on our x axis, which is just the year. Okay. We are building we are building up to something. See, it repairs it. I actually doesn't like that repair. Whatever. So I'm going to keep it how it was. That's my x axis. I can also specify to, you know, not show the x axis. Yeah. I can say actually axis is null. So if I say axis like that, now you see that the axis disappears, which is actually, you know, helpful in some situations. If you look at, and what we were looking at, did, 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 where was it? Concat. Here, for example, there is no axis here at all. You know, these these warning warming stripes, they don't have an axis at all. So there is some use for having no axis. So let's just stick with that for now. I can also specify in here as well. I can say I want to have a y axis because it's pretty standard to have a y axis. So again, I'm just going to. I copy, copy and paste primarily because I'm bad at typing, to be honest. Um, but also, I think it saves time with certain stuff. So Y axis and I want the field to be. Uh, so I start a type and then it will kind of prompt me. All right, this is I'm not sure if I can call it IntelliSense. Apparently that's a, a Microsoft word, but you get me. That's what it does. I choose that. I want to specify the data type. It's going to be quantitative. That works. And I made a mistake straight away. Oh, I forgot my comma. There you go. So now we have this. So now we're starting to see actually what we're building is a you know a visualization with an x-axis with a y-axis. You can see all our data is trying is starting to take shape, right? Cool. It's obviously missing quite a few things, you know. So one of the things that's missing potentially if you wanted, this is going to start looking a little bit messy when I do this, but just to show you again how you do certain things. Um, you want to show quite often on your visualizations like the value itself. You don't always show the value, but you can choose to, to show the value, right? So to do that, that is just another type of mark so here we had our layer currently the layer only has one mark so i'm going to change that you see that's all one mark if i want to add a second mark i'm going to do exactly what i did before i'm just going to copy this to save hopefully some time and then this is going to be my second mark i'm going to say mark but this time i'm going to say type 
I'm going to say text. OK. So mark type text. Is a text value and it can be whatever you whatever you want it to be pretty much. But I need to add some encoding just for the text because I need to specify what the text is going to be. So again. This is the mark here. I'm just going to go N coding. And in that encoding, I want the text. And then specify that I'm going to use a field. You can also just say the word value. You can also just say value and specify a value if you want to. But that makes most of the time very little sense. And I'm going to use the same field that's, of, of course, on my Y axis. Otherwise, it'd be weird. Average no smoothing, it's called. And then do that. And then close off my mark. And then if I've done it, yeah, OK. So. Let's scroll in and zoom in a little bit so you can see. Obviously, there are many things wrong here. For example, the marks are kind of on top of one another. And I'm not going to I'm not going to sort out all of this stuff. I'm going to show you a few of the things that you can do to fix this situation. I'm going to completely fix it because I don't want to just, you know, get too much into it. But because you, you can do so much, you can sort out some of these problems. The first one is going to be because look, the Y axis that we're using is this average no smoothing. Obviously, the Y axis is always the very tip of your mark, right? Which is why this is sitting right on top. So if I want to say, which usually you would do, I think nine times out of 10, you would want it slightly up or down or whatever. You can say mark type text. But what I can say also is specify a Y offset. Now I'm going to do a really basic version of this, OK? You can also make this dynamic and say if it's over a certain value, then here, if not there. But I'm going to do a basic version of that. So I'm going to do Y offset and I'm just going to say minus 10, yeah? Excuse me. So as I did that, you can see here now the text is up above and here it's all but it's also it's moved up everywhere yeah it's moved up there which is great but also at the bottom it's also moved up what you'd want to do is set a y offset that will say if it's below zero push it down if it's above zero push it up it's very straightforward to do well it's pretty straightforward to do but i don't want to get too much into it now because i don't want to kind of bog you down with lots of expressions and stuff um i can show you quickly in other visualizations but for what i wanted to, to create here i think it's probably a little bit too much so this is what we have going so far i'll stop for a second and, and see if there are any questions because i just want don't want to like overload you with me it's like sitting here coding um are there any questions uh, at this point that I, I'll, I'll be happy to answer i think there are only two questions in yeah. the chat so i yeah, go for it. I can't actually see the chat when I'm doing that, to be honest. Yeah, so, so the bond question here is, can you customize the spacing between bars? You can, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, you can customize. Question... Sorry, go for it. Uh, go, go, go for it. Uh, do you know? Uh, can you just point it with which I I can which? Uh, I think it's a bin spacing, something like that. We can add and add the space between the bars. Yeah, you, but you, you can specify like the um, the width of the bar. So I think a good example of that is if I just go out this visualization and do the whole classic one that I prepared earlier is um, if you go actually, maybe I can just do it here. This is. One way of doing that is if I go here, for example, and I have my my type bar i can say something along the lines of excuse me that gonna work yeah so i can specify the width of the bar right so as you can see here i type one so i have this thing i just copied and pasted in i'm sorry for the speed there um but in this bar i've specified the width of the bar yeah so you can say width and i've written band 1.1 which means it's goes off. So if I say, for example, width band 0 0.5, you'll get more of that sort of an effect, you know? OK, perfect. So, so yeah, you can, you, you, I mean, honestly, it's, I, I don't want to go too far, but once you, there's very little that you can't change. I mean, you can put everything where you want it to be. And that's a good thing and a bad thing, you know, because 
this is the point that I say quite often when I'm making videos or just that you can do this, you can do that. You can do it, but should you do it, you know? So you can do so much that you can actually create some pretty terrible things, but you can also create some pretty wonderful things. And, but for me, when I'm obviously always still learning and I, and I in no way profess to be any sort of expert in this Vega Light stuff, because, you know, I'm not, I just, do it a lot and what I learn I share so maybe I'm quite loud but it in no way makes me an expert um there's really everything every visual element can go exactly where you want it to go yeah so you're only thus far I've really only been restricted based on my own knowledge yeah of all the different ways to control your elements and stuff you know you can control them the colors so if we if we go back to something that i was you know creating before if i for example remove now i'm going to remove this y axis okay i'm going to get rid of it here and now i have this this setup this looks horrible so bear with me one second here and i'm going to say band 1.2 and i'm going to get rid of my text and I'm doing all this just to kind of show you like all the different ways you can you can control stuff. So we're going to go back to our um, big block. And the reason for that is probably because of this, because we do have this um, band width here. So now I have, I have my bars back. The color. So before I just specified a color, I said like color red, color blue. But again, you can specify the colors based on what, whatever you want, basically. So I'm going to, so I'm going to copy in a big bunch of text here, right? Because it's take me too long to to actually type it, and you'll see why in a second. So with the, within the encoding of this bar, what I'm going to do is add something for the color. So previously, I just had like color red or whatever. Close the encoding off. Immediately make a mistake. Oops, because I placed it in the wrong place. Good start. Sorry about that. So clean that up a little bit. Oh, I've made a mistake. This is terrible. How about done? Color field average. <clears throat> uh, I don't know what I've done to be honest. This is pretty bad. So again, let's just go to my emergency backup. So basically, talking about color, you can specify a single color. Yeah, you can specify a color range. There's a website which gives you a list of different color patterns. Or as you can see here. I'm actually just specifying which colors I want to use and the order in which they need to need to be applied. So really everything that you're looking at, you you decide. That's probably, I mean, the barrier to learn Vega Light is of course learning what each each individual element does. But this is why I say start with something really simple and basic, like a bar chart, and change change the elements of it yeah so again if we go back to something like bigger light and we go to our um examples yeah the more advanced you get you can literally click up to different visualizations and then see what exists in them and then change them bit by bit you know like here for example something we haven't looked at is i before i said i can offset values remember i said i can offset my values and say y offset or x offset is based on a number so i said and um, Y offset for the, for the text labels. Then I say, make it minus 10. Where in this situation, the X offset is based on the actual values, the group. So it automatically offsets it by the, by a category. Yeah. So once you, once you understand that something exists, in this case, an X offset, you can say, okay, I can type in a value, um, but how can I make that more advanced? And that is, a, a, is a, an example of that. In this situation, I've said, make it a group. And then you can go further and you can use something like, like expressions. And with expressions, you can really specify very precisely what you want it to be. Like if it's over a certain number, make it this. If it's under, make it this. It becomes, it's incremental learning, which is makes a lot of sense. 
if you have a use case, it's very helpful as well. If you want to, you know, just create like a standard bar chart, but add some different elements to it, a great way of doing that is by following that documentation. And you can just kind of like lead yourself down your own path based on your own kind of playing around, your own experimentation, that sort of stuff. Does that make sense? I hope so. Yeah. Sorry about this. I don't know why I've done that. And I don't want to kind of go through too much and you know, mess it up more, to be honest. But <laughs> usually I've missed something pretty, pretty obvious for sure. Um, but yeah, let me just copy and paste the entire whack and see what happens. It's not playing. No idea what's happening there. Maybe this. I don't know. Hmm. Pretty strange. That Always work. happen during the live session. Always. I have. <laughs> Always. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and, de and debug what, what what just happened, but yeah, that happened. Um, but basically, yes, the, the specification of certain elements makes it really helpful. I mean, if you look, if we go back to like for me, the really basic example is this bar chart and this is honestly one of my favorite ones because of just because it's so simple but for me so helpful you know it's again this is obviously the the more you the more you do it it looks really complex right? oh my god there's so much code it's really really not right because once you've created one thing that you're happy with say i've created all this bar this bar this bar once i've created those all i have to do is copy and paste it and change the y-axis yeah so if you remember before, I said, you know, you have one Y axis for the actual and y, one Y axis for the, for the plan. The top, like all that you have for the bar. So this entire section here, this is just, a, excuse me, wrong one. This section here is just the mark bar. And you can see that the field is the actual. And the one for this is exactly the same. The only difference is that the field is going to be like plan. So when you do that, you can see it moves, right? That's it. So the complexity of code was something, I, mean, I don't have a coding background like at all. I did some HTML back when I was like 16, now I'm 40, so a decent amount of time has passed. Um, so I have zero like background in coding and stuff. And maybe that's why when I saw something like, like Vega, I was like, okay, that looks a little bit too extreme for me. But Vega Lite for me, and maybe because also it uses JSON syntax, and I do a lot of work with APIs, which you're often reading JSON for as well, it kind of made sense, the, the structure of it. Um, but I really think it's quite a, um, a user-friendly experience to understand and to implement those changes across. And like I say, start with something small. I'm not saying, of course, that basically if you're going to be creating a... Um, if you're looking at Power BI and you're saying, okay, I want a bar chart and I don't know, I want like a really standard bar chart, you know, this is a weird bar chart. Um, I'm not saying you should use Deneb for every single visualization because that would be too extreme, right? If you have a report and you have a, for the sake of, okay, I want a line chart, cool. Let's, let's just make it more clear. I want a line chart, that's what I want. I want a really box standard line shot. There has to be nothing visually spe special about it. We're happy with that. Then fine, do that. <laughs> no one suggests that you use Denner for every visualization because it is, of course, more time consuming than using a standard Power BI visual. You have to create it yourself, yeah? But on those occasions where you do need something more, Denner is a great choice to go for. I will say though, once you start creating visualizations with Deneb, you'll probably find that you do it more and more often in situations where you wouldn't previously because because you know you can have more and because you get so used to the to having such control over what you can do using a standard visual just feels a lot more restricted you know and like i say yes they're going to improve stuff they're going to i mean they've they've already started uh, miguel's done some fan, um fantastic work but to give you the uh, the control that you have with Deneb is a is a long way off, and I think probably will never be achieved. And I fully admit I like to use it because I'm probably a little bit of a control freak in some regards. So if I can control everything in my visualization, then I'm much happier knowing that it's how I want it to look. Yeah. Um. Stuff that I've created that I'll be I'll be honest and say perhaps. 
the first things I wouldn't do, like if if Power BI, if like Miguel and the team did a nice update to the the matrices, the matrices, how you say that word, um, I would probably stop doing this. I only really do this because um, I like the uniformed columns. It's probably the hardest thing to create. So if someone said, okay, what thing that you create in Deneb you wish that you do you, you not like creating, you, you wish you didn't have to, I would say the matrices because they're a bit more complex to create. Um, even for Deneb, even for Vega Light, it's a little bit hacky, to be honest, but they work. But because I like how they look, I keep doing them. So there are certain things that I create that I love creating. Like, I mean, you know, the, the thermometer is basically just a combination of a circle and a bar chart and a line here, you know? So to stack these things together, again, I'm gonna, just gonna show you the code just for the sake of it. Just to stack these things together, you can see it becomes, it's not overly long, but it's a decent amount of code. This is an example, by the way, when I was saying about you can control using expressions, the color of stuff. As you can see here, expression is basically if my sales is greater or equal than to the target, then green. So I've got if statements for the expressions for, for the color. Once you know how to do that, you can do it for everything. You can do an expression for, as I say, the color, where things are located, um, just opacity, um, all the type of stuff. So once you learn how to do one thing, you can apply it to many, many marks and you get some quite a nice um, effect. One thing that I will say that is a little bit harder is if I go back to this example here, when I was clicking on stuff, it changes the opacity, changes the color. That's not a standard out of the box experience. You do actually have to switch something on for that. So actually I'll go with that quickly now. So if I go here, for example, into my then a visual, I do have to go into my settings and I have to switch these on. So this cross um, filtering, this stuff here, as you see, as I switch it on, it changes the visual because you had, so that's a bit more advanced and um, not massively so, but important to, to know that when you get into the visual, if you want to use cross highlighting, cross filtering, whatever, you have to come and switch them on here and change the code a little bit, but it's all really nicely documented here. Daniel did a great job of, of um, referencing how to do this and how it works and stuff. So again, full respect to Daniel, he's put in a lot of work to ensure that if you want to know how to do these things, documentation is there and I think I have a video for it as well but go to Daniel first because you know he created the thing mm -hmm. um yeah so other little bits and pieces um you know I mentioned before about exporting yeah so if you want to you can actually export um what you create so you export your code you type in the, the name and stuff your creator you can include a preview image if you want to you don't have to um, and then you click on the button and it exports the code for you so that you can apply that and then other people, and this is the thing about what I said before about working your organization, you know, if you want to kind of a, allow people to kind of use your visuals, but not really know too much about Vega Light or Deneb, you can do it this way. All they have to do is then basically take that code and it will automatically prompt you to remap that against your data, which leads me on to another point, which is really cool. If I have this visual and I've said my values are actual and plan, okay? If at some point I want to change, so I'm going to take this out, yeah? What it'll do is it'll recognize that something that you've referenced doesn't exist anymore. And you can click on this and say, okay, what do you want to use instead? What do you want to use instead of plan? So I'll just bring in a new value. I'll put it there. I'm not sure I've got something called actual two. I'm not sure how this might not be relevant data, but we'll see. And I'm going to go on actual two. I apply the mapping and then it applies that mapping. Obviously now it looks terrible. That's only because my measure doesn't make any sense for this data. And it's fine, but as you can see, it allows you to very easily, very quickly actually bring in a different data set and use it. You don't have to go into the code and change it yourself. It's very user friendly. It's basically a very clicky experience. So again, I'm going to say, okay, get rid of actual too. I change of mind. I did a terrible mistake. Let's go back to actual, do that. Click on actual, apply mapping, and then we're back where we started. So that's very user friendly. And I think that helps 
with this concept of a, of adoption from like a, a bigger organ organization or if you're you know you're working in a um you're a, a i don't know you you're working for multiple companies or um you're going into one company you're setting up their work and then you kind of leave can they support themselves well with a bit of effort they can i'm never going to say it's really easy you can just do it you, you can't if there's always going to be effort involved but probably less than you actually think yeah cool. nice. one yeah. final thing if i have time i have a few more minutes is that okay yeah, yeah, yeah cool um the a lot of what is controlled in um in vega light and stuff and, and denip is this config here so the config the best way to show is to go back to the documentation and if we go again just back to to, 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 to any example go quickly to let's pick this one this time doesn't matter it has a config and the config basically sets up a lot of what you're looking at so you know text size and text color fonts lots of different elements that you to be honest because they're kind of in a different section you forget that they're there uh, you can click here on this and actually just choose different configs and you'll see it'll change um so it helps you like you know if you want to just say okay mm, let's go and see la times look at look at that config or dark config if you like that you can just copy and paste that into um into your deneb I'm not sure if this will work i'm not sure how well this will work it might ruin it but whatever and then it'll see now you can something's changed like this is here whatever a lot of it's not going to work in this situation because i've specified a lot of my colors there um but basically you can have a look at the config here and change it there is also a power bi config which is very helpful which i believe um it was daniel who helped implement that to be honest what is important is that when you're actually doing this sort of thing is that you're aware that these things exist simply because if you create a good example is if you create something like an area chart right so do i have something that i, that I can use quickly Sparklings. so if if i can make this work quickly if i can't whatever my fault All right if i were to say i wanted to have this and I'm just going to quickly add back um, a Y axis. My field, and I'm going to use whatever, doesn't matter, some number. There you go. Oh, you give me one. <laughs> uh, and the axis. Okay, whatever works now. If I were to say here, make it an area chart. Um, and then type. One to ten. Yeah, so this is what I want to show you, an area chart. You see how you have your area chart and you have this kind of like line that goes up along the area. Like it doesn't, it's not just the area, there's like an area and like a, a darker line. That's like controlled here. You have area line true. And if I change this to false, you'll see that the line disappears. So there are things that you won't consider why they are there. And you might just think, oh, that's just there and I can't remove it. So always remember that there are lots of things in the config that are predefined for you. If you don't want to have it, you can just remove it. I have times where I've removed it because it, because it's it's frustrated me, for example. But generally speaking, it's good that it's there. It is very helpful. One of the ones that I created where I removed it was um, this one here because I, I wanted a completely different look, like regarding the text and stuff. So you can see here my config is much smaller. That's all stuff that I defined because I wanted the values, the text, all the colors, and all this to be different. So. Be aware that's there, but generally speaking, it's certain when you're getting started, it really will help you a lot with the um, with the config. Yeah. So, sorry, I know that was a lot of code stuff, and sorry for that mistake. By the way, the colors wouldn't wouldn't work. I didn't have time to look at it, and I just uh, usually it works. But 
Um, for like inspiration stuff, this needs to be updated to be quite honest, because I did this a while ago. This is not saying that you shouldn't use these. You should carry is Colosco is fantastic. She does amazing work with um, Dana Vega Light, as does Taze. Um, I think someone's put the, the link before when I was talking and I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think they did. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Shad also does amazing work. He, he's got a fantastic page for his um, on his GitHub. But there are more, to be honest, that I do need to update this for the people who have missed. I, I do apologize. I think someone linked Andres, which I appreciate. Um, there's a guy, I forget his name, who's quite active on LinkedIn, who creates amazing stuff, like really amazing. So um, I the visuals that I create, to be honest, are much more kind of like business usage type visuals. One or two that are a little bit different. I'm kind of trying to get a bit more creative, creative with what I do. But if you want to see some truly amazing um inspiring examples then um check out these three people and then actually a really good example is to go to linkedin and just hashtag deneb you know you'll find some people um, creating um, mm -hmm. some fantastic work there that would be um my recommendation are there any questions at all Perfect. well there are some questions uh, let me just ask the first one oh louise <laughs> Do you have any repository of your DNF templates we could use as a reference? Um, I have. I have to improve. I've put some on uh, my website. I'll be honest, I don't use GitHub because I really don't like GitHub. I know I should get better at it, <laughs> but um, I, I, if you check my website, there are some templates there and I will update it. I will make a considered effort in the coming weeks to improve how I share my templates. So I appreciate the question and um, I can assure you that when I do it, I will be loud about it on LinkedIn. So if you find me on LinkedIn, when I get it done, you'll you'll, you'll find it there. All right. That would be great, man. That would be great. And then the second part of the question is I'm interested in how you create the legends mm. as I'm struggling with creating a customized legend. It's a good question. So. Um, I have a video on it on my YouTube channel. However, I need to update it because someone very kindly emailed me a better version, which is what I love about Denna, by the way, people who use it, sharing new ways or they watch something. So oh, this is what works, but try this one. Um, it's, it's, it's a good question because there are certain visuals. For example, if we look at my, I use this example quite a lot. So let's go, where was it gone? Matrix and offset bar. If you create something like this, you actually won't by default get a legend. I think maybe this is where the question is coming from. Like I've just specified, put this bar there and put that bar there. Yeah. And that's very different to what we saw in the documentation. If I can go back to it, where we had those offset bars, because if you do this, it will create, if you say color and then specify, it'll create the legend by default. But if you create something the way that I've created this, it won't give you a legend. So for that situation, you can see what I've done here. This, I believe, da, 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 here is it marks circle or something. Basically, here somewhere or other, I've created a um, a layer. I've actually created a layer that creates the legend itself. So that is usually how I go about that. There are a couple of different ways. Um, I hope on a second. I'll go to the question again. I'm going to lend you. Yeah, do you create a new view? I created in a in a um in the same layer, but I just created a mark for it. Basically, that's what I'd be good. I'm not saying what I've done is correct. I'm absolutely not. That's just saying that that's how I learned to do it because basically I'm just going through experimenting. But um, as I say, I will the version that the other person actually the the version that the other person sent me is the same way that I did it but just with a slight variation which made it uh, actually a bit nicer that's it so basically what I do is in the same layer I create a mark and that mark serves as the um as the legend legend um, and that's legend you know legend part is in my experience is one mm. of the hardest part yep. of the creating the uh, visual with dinner because I had uh, I was working on one visual with the uh, line and bar and some row at the top of that to show the variance between them and the question from the team the end user was is it possible to add the legend 
to show the difference type of those the uh, things you use there. A bar mm. for the bar, uh, for example, a rectangle for the uh, a line for the line, but a rectangle yeah. for the bar, and then something like the row before the rows you use there. And I work a lot on it, but I couldn't find a way to this. So what I did, create the image, add it in the at the back of that visual. I said, okay, it's there. I will work on it, and if I find the solution, I will tell you. Oh, that's interesting. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree actually with with everything that you're saying that I found that actually controlling the legend has been the hardest this um, thus far. And I think that one of the reasons for that is, I mean, yes, because it's, but no, I think the reason is because the legend is something that you usually just take for granted. It's just there and exists. But because, and also because you're creating something that is of course much more complex, as I said before, there's more that you can do. Therefore, there's more that you need to do. There's more that you want to do. So you kind of create your own complexity and that's fine. Yeah. And that inspires you to learn. But yes, um, shortly put, the legend can be quite tricky. And um, on a few of the visualizations that I've been, it's actually that um, a perfect example, the 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 warming, the warming stripes, yeah. the warm strike. legend for that actually drove me crazy because to get it right was, yeah. was quite irritating. Yeah. Yeah, it was really hard. So uh, there's another question. Will the code length uh, interaction setting affect the response of the chart? Um, good question. I mean, my short answer would be no. And then the second However, part of the... Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, I would, I'm going to have to say it depends, but I think just no, actually. I mean, <laughs> I've I've never created anything where I mean it no it's just the measures that you put in if you have a if you have basically connected to a data set where it's a very very complex measure but for me I don't want to say anything that's completely incorrect here but I don't think the length of the code would affect the performance of the visualization no it's the data that is actually in the visualization that affects the performance yeah, yeah. um okay and then there is another second part of this question does the PBIX file size affect if we have a few custom visuals I don't know, actually. It's a good question. I don't use my, I honestly, I don't use many custom visuals. So if if you mean if I'm using like, if I have like 10 different custom visuals, or do you mean if I'm using 10 um, Deneb visuals in one report? Um, not significantly, not, nothing significant enough to actually to mm -hmm. worry about anything, to be honest. If you're getting to the state, to the size of your um, PBIX file, where you have to worry about that, it's not because of Deneb, it's because of maybe, I don't know, some other thing that you've got in there, like data modeling or whatever, but it's not going to, um, like I said, the only time, the only time I've had any issue using Deneb from a performance perspective has been if I've connected live to a very large data model. Mm. I've had a couple of situations where for that, I got this really annoying WebView 2 error um, because of, you know, like, RAM or availability of resources and stuff that I've had issues with. However, I got them, I got the same issues when I wasn't using Deneb, but it just took slightly longer to get there. You know, when you kind of, if you, if, if you're working, like if you're working like connected live to a, a cube with lots of uh, complex calculations and stuff, you can feel this, the file at some point trying to like slow down and um, starting to slow down. And this is just before the, the WebView 2 error kicks in. That I get slightly more frequently when I'm using Denner, but that's all custom visuals because no. all custom visuals by definition will just take up um, a bit more resources. Yeah. So say one more thing uh, regarding performance issues and stuff. If you are um, experiencing performance issues, what you can do in the settings is switch from your random mode SVG to Canvas, okay? If you do that, yeah, it actually takes up let, but if you see the difference in, in the, the visual there, I've zoomed right in. If I go to canvas, it's kind of like soft around the edges, a bit blurry. Go to SVG, mm. of course, it's perfectly clean. So obviously yeah. you want to stick to SVG as much as you can, but if you're having performance issues, um, you can also switch to canvas mode and it will like ease that burden. But again, um, these are kind of like, I think quite extreme cases. I've, I've I've had reports. I mean, I have a, a report that I create for fantasy football, and I've been slowly switching it completely to Deneb, and that hasn't had any performance issues at all. Perfect. So that was the last question in the chat box. So, 
if there is any other question, please feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, we can wrap this session up. Cool. Sorry. Um, no question. question. Oh, yeah, there is one. Uh, yep. So uh, just wonder, like, if there's like the setting will be uh, indirective, that if you resize the, the, the visual, one, will it affect the setting, like the space between um, chart? It depends it how you do it, right? So I think I gave an example before when I had the, um, I moved move the bars kind of closer or further away from one another with this band. When you do that, uh, I can just use an example that I already have. If you do it in a certain way, so let me just fix this one because it's still on uh, canvas. So here, for example, you can see it's moving and it's moving pretty fine. Obviously, if you scrunch it up, it's going to be a nightmare, uh, right? Your screen is not shared. You didn't share your screen. Oh, I, oh man, I did I fix? I'm so bad at that. I apologize. So start again. OK. If <laughs> so, this visual that I created here, I specified here like the, the width of the bars, etc. So the band with 0 0.7, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you if you do it in a certain way, if you, so you can see now I'm making it bigger and it's working perfectly, right? But you can specify things in a certain way that aren't dynamic. So that completely depends on what you choose to how you basically write the code, which specifications you have. Because of course, sometimes for me, a good way is to know, of course, the size of the visual before you create it. However, if you are working with dynamic date ranges, right? more values come in so that's when you want to ensure that you actually are making something that's dynamic what you can do is here for example um this one you want to ensure what you can do is try not to break this and do it badly yeah this one for example doesn't all fit within the visual it slides along and that's something that i did by specifying the width in a different way right so if you specify the width um in a certain way, it won't fit within the container. Yeah, it will actually just, as the data grows, you'll have to slide to the left and to the right. Yeah, so you, I think it's, it was specified here. I can't remember to be honest, but you can really choose what you want. Do you want it all to fit within the container or do you want it to have to scroll along with the more that data comes in, which is a better way of doing something, as I say, if you have something like the matrix in your, that's, you know, that behavior is going to occur. Does that make sense to answer the question at all? I hope so. Yeah, should be okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Any other question or? I saw someone raised his or her hand. Was that the hand a high five or you raise your hand? <laughs> okay, we consider that as a high five. Fair enough. So I'll take okay. it. Okay. If you thank have, you, if Ben. You, yeah, my pleasure. I just want to final thing. If you have, if you start using this um, Vega Light L, or if you want to, um, feel free to just like shoot me questions on LinkedIn and stuff. I I try my best to answer any questions that come at me. I miss them sometimes, you, but no. um, reach out and I'll try my best to help you start to do this because it's very cool. All right. That's really great. Thank you, mate. Cool. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your great presentation and accepting my invitation, course, sharing your you knowledge, that. sharing your time with us. Hopefully we can have another session maybe in the near future uh, for about other things in the DNF. I'm pretty sure there are many, many other sides of DNF we can talk about that. Oh yeah, but, for sure. Yeah, again, thank you so much and thank you, thank you. to the people join us for this great session. Uh, okay, thank you and we'll see you soon. Catch you later. Thank you everyone. Take care. Take care. Goodbye. Bye.